Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our special event, um, Why I'm Still a Christian. Um, we had some slight technical difficulties, but it's okay because God is with us. But in case you didn't know, this was supposed to be an event that was going to be live streamed on both Facebook and YouTube at the same time. But we still have some more kinks to work out with our multi-streaming, so we're going to try that again. But um, I'm glad to be here with you all tonight um, and not to worry, we will jump right on YouTube right after this. Um, so I'm going to put my name up for those of you who don't know me, but it is, yeah, good to see you all. And hopefully, I mean, most of our listeners, most of our congregation finds us on Facebook. So maybe you'll see if you can't find us on YouTube, you might jump over to Facebook and figure out why. But it is good to be here tonight. I'm happy to see all of you. Um, and we wanted to try something different. So um, we figured instead of me just doing this on a Sunday, like I tend to, um, we wanted to have some special events. And yes, this is the first time we've had an event really in my whole time as being a pastor that did not take place on a Saturday or a Sunday. So I'm thankful for those of you who've chosen to join us right now. And I'm thankful for those of you who will end up watching later. Um, but this is an important discussion that needs to happen. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to open us up in prayer and then um, we're going to get started. All right. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege to come before you once again. We pray that you would just be in the midst of this discussion. Um, let your glory fall on this place and on this broadcast that we will all be better representatives of you for the time we have spent together. Help us to be timely. Help us to be relevant. And help us to give you the glory and the honor that you are so worthy of in this time. These things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, yeah, so good afternoon. Well, good evening, everybody. And hi, Mom Rhonda. It's good to see you. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to explain a little bit about why we're having this event. See, um, it is Black History Month. And one thing that happens pretty much every Black History Month is that we end up falling into this conversation. It's a bit of a repetitive conversation, if you will, but it's one about um, our history for those of us who identify as descendants of enslaved Africans. So the conversation goes something like this, that we know that our ancestors were stolen from their land, stripped of their culture, stripped of their identity, stripped of anything that could have, you know, anchored them in a sense. And of the things they were stripped of, the thing that we don't talk about as much is their faith, is their religion. But when they came to well, this country that is now the United States, they became Christians. But it wasn't necessarily a voluntary thing. They became Christians because their enslavers were Christians and made them into Christians. So therefore, the conversation is knowing that for all intents and purposes, we only became Christians because um, the enslavers of our ancestors were Christians. Why do we remain Christians, right? And it is a relevant question for a lot of people. Um, I know that there are a lot of um, religious organizations that are coming into prominence these days, you know, as people are trying to reconnect with their more or less ancestral heritage. You know, we can think about all the conversations happening about the Orishas right now, you know, which are Yoruba from, you know, what we would now refer to as Nigeria. Or we can think about people who have become black Hebrew Israelites or even to some extent people who became um, black Muslims. That the gist of it was that for people, especially in this country, who have been stripped of their history, um, there is a lot of interest in trying to reclaim some of what was taken from us. So for people who have those conversations, they wonder how people like me, you know, could, knowing the history, um, still identify not only as a Christian, but to be a pastor, because for from their perspective, I represent the institution that was used to justify a lot of what happened to my ancestors. So um, I usually bring this up to some extent every year in a sermon, but I figured it's an important enough discussion that it can be a standalone um, event. And hey, mom, good to see you too. So what we're going to do is we're going to have 
a brief discussion here. I'll try to open it up for some questions and answers. And just like how it is during our usual church service, um, I can see you all in the comments. Again, for those who might just be jumping in. And actually, I need to share it on my Facebook. So I'm going to do that right now. For those who might be just be jumping in, although the um, plan was for this to be on um, YouTube at the same time, we have some kinks to work out for our multi-streaming. So we're going to put it up later like we always do. But I still feel like this is a major accomplishment for us to have this event on a Monday night. The show, you know, the work that we do isn't just limited to Sunday mornings, right? So I'm sharing this on my social media right now, but it's good to see you all and thank you all for sharing. So with that, we're going to discuss, well, from my perspective at least, that's why this is not quite a Bible study. This is just some of the intellectual arguments that I have been able to use to help me with my Christian journey. And I believe that these things will help you all too. All right. So with that, the first thing I want to discuss is this. Christianity is not a white man's religion. Again, Christianity is not a white man's religion. See, usually when these conversations come up, um, people are pretty quick to say like, well, Christianity is the invention of the white man for the purpose of subjugating people of color. But see, there are some things about that that are not you know, really accurate. I can understand why people would feel this way, given that when we think about Christianity today, we think about Roman Catholicism, right? But there's something I want to point out to you all. So this graphic right here is of the Roman Empire. And one thing that you all might not, you know, be clear on, but let me see if I can get this pointer. Okay, my pointer is, has showed up. So as you can see, this area right here where the pointer is, that is Carthage. Well, let me just talk about this whole area right here. In case you couldn't tell, the Roman Empire included North Africa, right? So Alexandria, which was one of the major centers of learning, was in Egypt, right, uh, on the Nile River Delta. And Carthage was another major outpost of the Holy Roman Empire. But it was also located in North Africa, and it was a very important place to the development of what later became Christianity. And I'm looking this up right now to tell you what country Carthage is in right now. So just that we understand, you know, Carthage is in what would now be Tunisia, so Northern Africa, all right? But I want to bring this up because in spite of the fact that Africa was a part of the Roman Empire, at least Northern Africa was, and therefore Africa was also a part of the development of what became Christianity in the era, you know, right behind the birth of Jesus, that already lets us know that, you know, at least there were some people of color who were involved. And truth be told, as a lot of us understand, um, even though Jesus is often um, represented as a white man with flowing blonde hair and blue eyes, the reality is that in that time period, such a person would not have lived in that particular region. You know, there was nothing in the Bible about Jesus having an appearance that stuck out relative to others around him. So we know that Jesus at least would have looked like a modern day Arab, if not an African, you know, there's some um, controversy about that. But um, the other thing that I do want to point out is as a result, there are even some um, people that we would consider fathers of the early church who have black heritage. And one is this man right here. Now, I do not expect any of you to know who that is, but this is somebody who we all have heard of. All right. So let's see. Are there any guesses? I'm going to give you a little bit more time, but I don't expect anybody to figure out who this is. So I am going to tell you right now, this is St. Augustine. Yes, Augustine, one of the early forefathers of even the Catholic Church. You know, we think about places like St. Augustine, Florida, named for him. He was an early thinker in the Christian church. He has been sainted, you know, within Roman Catholicism. Um, but one thing we leave out is that 
Augustine was from a place called Hippo, and Hippo was in North Africa. So there has been a movement recently to reclaim the African heritage of some of these early um, people in the church. And for the record, St. Augustine is not the only one. You know, there are also people like Origen, Tertullian, and many others. But I just liked using this one because this was a great picture of a visibly black man who was typically not thought of as a visibly black man. Um, but the other thing I want to point out is even though we think about Roman Catholicism, when we think about the oldest Christian churches, that's not true. The oldest Christian churches are actually the Ethiopian Coptic Church. And those churches, you know, located in Ethiopia, which if you know anything about African history, you know that Ethiopia is an area of Africa that was never colonized. So whereas much of the rest of the continent ended up having their, you know, culture stripped, their norms shifted, their language taken away, and their resources plundered, Ethiopia has pretty much been consistently the same culture for, you know, millennia at this point. So, as such, the Ethiopian Coptic, the Ethiopian Coptic Church is the oldest continual Christian church in existence. So, even though we think about Roman Catholicism, Ethiopian Coptics have them beat in terms of age, right? So, when we think about Mary and Jesus, we tend to think about things like this because of the dominance of Roman Catholicism and the you know role of European colonialism in our religious thought, right? But this is how Jesus and Mary are represented in Ethiopian Coptic um, iconography. And as you can see, if you've ever been to Ethiopia or know people who are Ethiopian, they tend to have round faces and large eyes. So they represented um, people in the Bible to look like them. I know it's pretty like revolutionary for us as black people to see this because we're so used to not seeing ourselves represented in how we um, see those in our faith, those who came before us. Or... This is a depiction of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And you can see at least they're not all, you know, blonde with blue eyes. But the point is, um, you could say that they were white if you want to. Maybe they were, you know, slightly dark white. But you get what I'm saying here. But for the Ethiopian Coptic church, this is how they represent that exact same picture, right? See? And... Lastly, let's think about something that is famous, the Lord's Supper. We've all seen these pictures, you know, some were blonde, um, some redheads, Jesus had pale skin. But again, when you look at how this would have been represented for Ethiopian Coptics, we see once again that, again, they are darker. They have round faces. They have large eyes. So what does this tell us, really? It tells us that in a lot of ways, the mental images or the images, I should say, that we are able to uh, pull together, we think about people of our faith, that those images are dictated by those who were in control. So the reason that a lot of us tend to believe that Jesus and all the people in the Bible were white in spite of the fact that they were in, you know, North Africa and the Arab, you know, region, Arab Peninsula, Arabian Peninsula and things like that. A lot of times we think that they were white because those who were in power um, told us that they were. But for those of us who identify as people of color in this context, it is comforting to see that these um, people in the Bible probably looked more like us than how we've been taught, and it is amazing to see that um, our Ethiopian brothers and sisters, our Ethiopian family, they have always believed that those who were in the Bible looked like them. All right? So I want to make sure we're clear on this. As I've said, let me go back to the point. Christianity is not a white man's religion, okay? 
So, but now we're going to move on to the next point that I have, all right, which is this. The Christianity that our enslaved ancestors were given is not the Christianity that they practiced. Again, the Christianity that our enslaved ancestors were given is not the Christianity that they practiced. And you may wonder, who are these people in this picture right here? Well, these are the Fisk Jubilee Singers. And who are they? Well, they were a choir that was formed out of Fisk University. Fisk University is in Nashville, Tennessee. And so what they did is they took what we now know as the Negro spirituals and they arranged them and they traveled all over the country singing these Negro spirituals to raise money for their school. All right. So a lot of the arrangements that we think of today surrounding the Negro spirituals, we call them, are related to the Fisk Jubilee singers in some way. But you may wonder, why am I talking about Negro spirituals here? Well, they are a very good example of our enslaved ancestors taking the Christianity they were given and turning it into something different. See, we understand, we look at history that a lot of times the motivation for teaching our enslaved ancestors Christianity was to make them more compliant slaves. And again, it is documented that especially in um, the Caribbean, there was a particular version of the Bible known as the Slave Bible, which only contained, you know, passages about um, slaves being obedient to their masters and things like that, you know. Anything that would have made somebody be more compliant was left in, but anything that would give you some ideas that, you know, God doesn't like what you're going through would have been taken out. So we know that the main reason that our enslaved ancestors were taught Christianity was to try to make them more compliant. But we also know that that is not what happened. Because, see, if you know the history, you understand that Sundays as a day of worship, that was the time that um, on plantations that our enslaved ancestors had a bit more freedom, a bit more, I guess, latitude, if you will, that they were allowed to worship for a longer time period and they were allowed to have a lot more of their time spent, you know, unsupervised. So as such, church, it wasn't just a time when they worshiped. It was also a time that they could, you know, spend time with their families because we understand that at these plantations, you know, there were husbands, there were wives and there were children who weren't really given a chance to spend time together during the week because they were, you know, considered property. But the big thing that happened during these church services was that in some cases, these church services became, um, I guess they became, if you will, meetings about eventual escape, you know, plots for a revolt, plots to run away, you know, so a lot of the early plots that took place, you know, when the enslaved would fight back against their owners or they would run away, a lot of this information was passed along during worship services, right? And one of the vehicles that they used to pass this information was what we refer to as the Negro spiritual. So that is why we had the picture of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Um, and because the, the Negro spiritual, which we still have a lot of examples of today, it's a great example of the fact that the Christianity that our ancestors were given is not what they finally practiced, right? Because, for instance, let's take the song, I Couldn't Hear Nobody Pray. Well, they would sing the song, I Couldn't Hear Nobody Pray, to make it clear that to whoever was like planning and plotting about what they would do and how they would escape, that they need to be quiet because, you know, master was coming. So you'd sing, I can't hear, I couldn't hear nobody pray or I couldn't hear nobody pray. pray. It was be quiet. The overseer is watching. We don't want them to hear what we're talking about. All right. Or let's see, this is the Big Dipper. We had songs like Follow the Drinking Gourd. What was the Drinking Gourd? The Drinking Gourd was a reference to the Big Dipper. And so that song was used to communicate among the enslaved that when you escape, follow the Big Dipper, because if you follow that, that will take you north. 
and north is where freedom is. Or one of the more famous examples, and this is a picture of a baptism. Today in baptisms, we still sing the song Wade in the Water. You know, we think about it as, you know, a song about coming and being baptized. But that song was actually a reminder that when you escape, if you get in the water, the hounds that they will send after you cannot follow your scent. So if you get in the water, the hounds can't follow you, right? So why would I bring these up? I brought these up because these are examples of the fact that even though our enslaved ancestors were taught, um, were taught Christianity as a means to try to make them more compliant, they were able to even read between the lines and see that the God that they were being taught about wasn't okay with how they were being treated. And they were able to use their understanding of this God in order to plot their own liberation. All right. So that is something that is encouraging to me. When you think about that, that they didn't just take what was given to them and not question it. They wrestled with it in their own way and they turned it into something that could motivate them in their plans to escape and they turned it into something they could use to transmit knowledge to help each other to escape. All right. And this brings me to, I guess, the last of the points we're going to discuss today, which is this. The legacy of the Christianity of the enslaved is more consistent with the teachings of Jesus than much of mainstream Christianity. And I know this is a controversial take, but. Hear me out. So one of the things that we deal with today in our society is when we think of Christian, especially in this particular country, we think of evangelicals. And when we think of evangelicals, all we know about them is they don't like gay marriage and they don't like abortion. But they do like, you know, politicians who are immoral like Trump. Um, they do tend to like leaders who are bullies, you know, like Trump as well. It's not all about Trump, but you get what I'm saying, that there was a time period that evangelicals leaning toward the Republican Party was seen as them leaning toward the moral party. But now it doesn't feel like that anymore. But I'm saying this because when we think about um, evangelicals, that's who we tend to think of when we think about Christians in this country. And I know I talked about this on Sunday for those of you who listened, but there was an article that I read that talked about how some evangelical pastors, you know, when they would preach out of the Beatitudes saying, you know, blessed are the meek for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit for, um, you know, all those blessings, all those blessings to groups that generally would be looked down upon, if you will, you know, and after there were some pastors who said that you know we preached from the beatitudes and after service somebody came up to us and said where'd you get those liberal talking points from and you know for those pastors are like oh well you know it's literally the words of jesus in matthew chapter five and you know what their church members said to them they said oh that doesn't work that way anymore you know so all that is to say that a lot of what we think of as mainstream Christianity in today's society isn't really in line with what um, Jesus taught. And that is one of the difficulties that we have as believers today is that we have, you know, disdain of the misrepresentation because there are a lot of people just loud and wrong. All right. But, um, I'm going to talk about a few people who have introduced some thought processes and theologies that I believe at least have helped to, you know, right some of these wrongs. So, the, so, but before I get to that, it's just a reminder that when we think about the civil rights movement and we think about leaders in the South who mobilized, it's not an accident that you know, a lot of those early leaders like Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were pastors because, you know, the black church in that time period was one of the few entities that we as people of color had where we could be seen as fully actualized, you know, members of society. 
So there was an amount of power that existed in those organizations at that time period. Um, and let's see, and getting back to the point, um, if we think back, they, those leaders were very clear about the role that Christianity played in the liberation of all people. And I say that because one thing that is helpful for us to remember is that if we pay attention to the early Christians, they were persecuted, they were marginalized, they were outsiders, they were not the majority, they were not the ones who were in power. And in some ways, their marginalized status helped them to stay closer to God. So, therefore, you shouldn't be surprised that there are some theologians that actually feel like the marginalized status of black people helps us to have a better understanding of how God works, all right? And one such person is James Cone. So Reverend James Cone, um, and he, he died not too long ago, but he's considered the father of what we call, um, I guess, black liberation theology. And in general, this comes from a book that he wrote in 1969. Um, once I find, of course I had the notes. And I misplaced my notes because I was looking up Carthage. But um, so in general, James Cone wrote a book in 1969 that was called Black, Liber Black Theology of Liberation. And in general, he argued that God identifies with the struggles of Black Americans for justice and liberation. So and you wouldn't think this would be such a revolutionary concept, but in a lot of ways, you know, it was revolutionary, especially because this may have been some things that people were saying maybe in their congregations, but for him to go into the ivory tower and speak this kind of um, argument and do so boldly and with confidence, it's something that wasn't really expected. Although we can understand for it happening in 1969, um, it was right in the middle of the black power movement. But that perspective is very important because it is a reminder that, as I've said, other groups in our society, other groups in our world have had a chance to center their faith around their own experiences. But those of us who identify as African-Americans in this country often feel you know, hesitant to do so. Um, well, James Cone, we can say is the father of a lot of the perspectives that even I say on a pretty regular basis during service, you know, understanding that, yes, based on what Jesus said in Luke 4, verse 18, that, you know, he really does care about the liberation of people. That's why he came. Yes, he came to save us from, you know, hell and eternal damnation, but he also came to deliver us from an unjust system now. And I believe that James Cone is largely responsible for pushing that particular perspective, especially as it relates to those of us who are um, the descendants of enslaved Africans. But I don't want to just leave out, um, I don't want you to think it's something that only men did. This is Katie Cannon, Reverend Katie Cannon, also an academic. And in 1985, she wrote an article called The Emergence of Black Feminist Consciousness. And in a lot of ways, she wrote this article um, in tension against what um, James Cone had written. And in this, she, who's considered one of the forerunners of um, womanist theology, um, she introduced the term womanism. Well, she used it in this article. She wasn't the first person to ever use it, but she used it in this article to refer to an approach to interpreting the Bible that is also concerned with black women's liberation. All right. So she took it a step further from where James Cone left off by saying, well, yes, God does care about the liberation of black people. And he identifies with that. But we can also learn a lot more about the nature of God by looking at God from the experiences of a black woman, all right? And so this is pretty abstract and there'd be a lot more information I had to give in order to do this justice. 
But what I'm making is clear of is that these particular schools of thought, these particular theological arguments, if you will, tie back into the liberation, the liberatory aspect of the gospel message that often gets lost, especially in mainstream Christianity today. And so I believe it is the role of the church to remind us that the gospel isn't just here to save us from eternal damnation. The gospel is also here to, as I said earlier, save us from the unjust systems that exist in our society today. So with that, um, that is why I said that in many ways, the legacy of the Christianity of the enslaved is more consistent with the teachings of Jesus than much of mainstream Christianity. I know that's a lot to process, but anyway, that brings me to the end. That's really all I prepared for this evening. I wanted to make sure that you all are clear that this is something that has helped me just to understand that I personally am fine with still identifying as a Christian because of the fact that, um, Christians in general, Christianity in general, um, is complicated, but I'm fine with still identifying as a Christian because I understand that people of color have been a part of Christianity from the very beginning, including Jesus and his disciples, if we're honest about it. Um, I understand that the oldest Christian church that has been in existence continually is the Ethiopian Coptic church, which is in Ethiopia and not the Roman Catholic church, which is in, you know, Italy. Um, I understand that even though my ancestors were taught Christianity as a means of making them more compliant, that they turned it around and used it to plot their own escape and to justify their own eventual um, freedom and their own equality, right? And as we're talking about this, you know, I am wearing a Black History shirt that I tend to wear. And I want to make sure that we all can see what it says, all right? So right here, this is an equal sign. So this is a greater than sign. And this is a division sign. So what my shirt says is equality is greater than division. And... I believe that, again, our enslaved ancestors, they may have been given a faulty version of Christianity, but they turned it into something that they could use to push for their own liberation, push for their own freedom, push for their own belief that they were equal and that God cared and that God loved them and that just like God delivered the children of Israel, God would deliver them as well, you know, and the fact is that because we have been in this marginalized state as people of color, we can also identify with the fact that the point of the gospel message wasn't just um, to save us you know, from the afterlife, but was to make things better for us now. And it also will help us not to fall in the same traps that others have fallen into in terms of using faith in order to... Um, yeah, gain wealth and prestige and power and things like that. And I can say, you know, obviously there are aspects of the black church today that don't adhere to these sorts of things, right? I mean, we can think about the prosperity gospel, which is much more concerned with making money and comfort than anything else. But realistically, the legacy of the Christianity that our ancestors were taught is the liberation the belief that the gospel is here to transform our lives, to free us from bondage, to free us from unjust systems. And that is really all I prepared for today. So before I close, does anyone have any questions? You know, you can feel free to type them in.
Okay, well, I know I don't see any questions, but I want to thank you all for joining us for this. We'll probably try to do these sorts of things more often. And maybe next time I will be able to get the multi-stream working correctly so that it will be streaming across YouTube at the same time. But right now, I am thankful to see all of you who joined us. I know, especially on a Monday night, you know, there are a lot of other things you could have been doing, but I'm thankful to see all of you. I'm thankful for everybody who shared. And I'm thankful for you and indulging us. We try to do something different and try to um, improve our educational offerings at this church, if you will. But if there are no questions and I don't see any that came up, don't worry. If you have some more questions, you can still like message me later and I will bring them up. But I, will, I have no problem responding later. But if there are no questions right now, I am going to close us out in prayer. But thanks again for joining us. And I look forward to us having more small discussions like this in the future, you know, as time permits. All right. With that, let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege to come before you once again. We pray that you would just have your way. We pray that you would move in us and just allow us to have a better understanding of who you are and um, what you would have for us to do in this society today. Help us to increase our understanding and to represent you to the best of our ability. Um, help us to speak out when we see things that are being done the wrong way and to truly um, live as you have designed for us to live. But we just pray for all those who attended this um, discussion, that you would reward them for the time that they sacrificed, and that you would just be with each and every one of us as we attempt to draw closer to you right now. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to upload this to YouTube momentarily. But thank you all for um, attending. If you've got any questions, feel free to reach out. But I appreciate you all for even sitting through it. All right. God bless you all.